delighted uh, to be here this evening uh, to honor Herbert Scoville Jr. and his legacy that is embedded in the Herbert Scoville Jr. Peace Fellowship. You all know, and I'm so honored that so many of his family members are here tonight, that Dr. Scoville was a nuclear arms activist and was particularly focused on encouraging young people to come into the field. I also want to honor in these remarks tonight another great champion, John Isaacs. <laughs> who has led all of us for so many years to work for a more peaceful and livable world. It is just like John and Herbert Scoville that when I told John I would do any event he wanted, one, in part, in thanks for his and the community's enormous and effective support for the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, better known as the Iran Nuclear Agreement, John asked me to speak here to the next generation of arms controllers. And that says a lot about the future. And I would be remiss if I didn't remark that I noticed tonight I love you guys. I've been married to one for 36 years, but I am so impressed by the number of really phenomenal young women who are Scoville partners. So, thank you. Hello. <laughs> Having been the very first, which is shame on us as a country, but the very first woman under secretary for political affairs, uh, it is absolutely crucial uh, that uh, we have diversity, and there's some more diversity that you need among the fellows, but I'm sure you're working on that. Um, uh, but the two, uh, these aren't in my remarks, but in the, the two people who spent more time with the Iranians than anyone else were Helga Schmidt, Kathy Ashton, and then Federica Mogherini's deputy, a phenomenal European Union diplomat, extraordinary German diplomat, and myself. So two women were most often sitting opposite all those guys. I was asked to make a few remarks about the negotiation. And you all know, I'm sure, unlike a lot of audiences I speak with, you know the details of the agreement. And you probably picked up something about the politics around the agreement. So I thought maybe I'd give you a little bit of the behind the scenes as you prepare the future. First of all, to even have a chance at success of such a complex agreement, one has to have a fantastic team. I'm not a nuclear physicist or even a scientist. In fact, I was trained as a social worker a community organizer, and a clinician. I must say those clinical skills have sometimes come in handy. <laughs> Not just with Iranians, members of Congress. Um, I'll come back to that skill set in a moment, but first to the team. We had a core team of 15, but we were supported by literally hundreds in our government. Bob Einhorn, now at Brookings, led the expert team in early negotiations. And then Dr. T Jim Timby, a nuclear physicist and literally an institution at the State Department that you know very well, Kathleen, led our expert team through the concluding years of the negotiation. And I should stop and note that as the Nuclear Security Summit happens this week, it is also Jim Timby's last week in the Department of State after 44 years, having put his hands on virtually every arms control agreement for the past 44 years. Most people in the world don't know Jim Timby's name. They may know mine, some of them, but they don't know his. But quite frankly, there is no arms control agreement that exists today that the United States has been part of that was not helped to get there or led there by Jim. So when you see him, 
and when you have your next gathering, you should have him. He is an extraordinary, extraordinary expert who has made change uh, in this country and in this world. In addition to Jim, we had other experts on the team in nuclear matters and on sanctions and missiles. But every time we had an idea, which was very often, it went to our labs for validation and for work. Towards the end of the negotiation, when my Iranian counterparts told me they were bringing Dr. Ali Salati, Salahi, MIT-trained vice president of Iran and head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, we brought Secretary Moniz to the table as well, also of MIT. <laughs> and the technical work intensified and ultimately came to fruition. I saw Ernie at lunch today, and I was joking with him uh, just as I was going into a national security uh, meeting, uh, a principles committee meeting on the Iran negotiation in the Situation Room. I got an email from my Iranian counterpart, Abbas Arachi, that they had decided they were going to bring uh, Dr. Salahi to the negotiation. Yes, so who are you going to bring? So I walked into the Situation Room. Uh, Secretary Kerry was there, Ambassador Rice, National Security Advisor. I said, I just got this email literally before I walked in. And I think there's only one person. And almost in unison, we said, Secretary Moniz. At that moment, Secretary Moniz walked in. This was, I think, a Wednesday. And I said, guess what you're doing this weekend? <laughs> no agreement could have been reached without this team. They were inventive, creative, and precise. And you may never know their names but there would be no agreement without them. They taught me more than I ever wanted to know about all things nuclear. <laughs> they challenged me and challenged each other, and they got the job done in a way that was transparent and could be monitored and verified. My contribution was to lead the team, which included lawyers, communications experts, intelligence analysts, uh, and other folks and more. My social work skills, ability to see all before me, to see all the elements of the Rubik's Cube, to understand the interests of the other side of the table, and all of the sides of the table, I'll come to that in a minute, and understand and make use of human nature would have been an empty suit without the scientists. And all of us had the leadership of the President of the United States and the Secretary of State who were crystal clear about the objective. Iran should never and could never obtain a nuclear weapon. And all pathways to fissile material, uranium, plutonium, covert, should be shut down. The President and the Secretary also learned and sweated the details. At more than one moment, usually quite late at night, if not the middle of the night given the time difference, from Lausanne or Vienna, Vienna we would have a security conference, secure video conference, with the President. The United States delegation was very lucky because we had the means to have all of the assets and all of the equipment we needed for secure communications. Uh, it was quite, quite a luxury for us. Uh, the president in those secure video conferences would ask very detailed questions and give instructions with the clarity necessary for a successful negotiation. Not everything was high tech or even highly scientific. My Iranian counterparts were very hesitant early on to put things down on paper, since they would have to report back and they didn't feel we were far enough along. So I asked folks to find me a very large classroom blackboard size, movable whiteboard on wheels. I used it to put up all the elements and then we walked through them, elaborating where we thought each other was. Of course, we all took down notes, we all wrote it down but we wrote it down ourselves, and it helped to move us forward. My expert colleagues then began to use the whiteboard as well, since numbers, formulas, details could be put up and then erased, but ideas could be floated and discussed. While we were working, we were doing so as well with the European Union, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China. I joke, and it's not much of a joke, that I negotiated inside the United States government, I negotiated with the US Congress, I negotiated with the P5 plus one and the EU, both bilaterally and multilaterally. 
I negotiated with Israel. I negotiated with the Gulf states. I negotiated with other partners around the world who had an interest, those who imported Iranian oil, for instance, and occasionally with Iran. <laughs> and of course, we were always consulting with the International Atomic Energy Agency, since that institution would have to monitor and verify anything agreed, and we may needed to make sure that it was technically feasible and doable. The point of my telling you these elements is to reinforce that each of you as fellows and what you were doing to advance your interests advances the cause of international peace and security. You are in fellowships with terrific organizations that will help you hone not only your expert and technical skills, but your advocacy skills, your political skills, your diplomatic skills, your organizational and management skills, your communication skills, your leadership skills, your team skills, and your human skills. You will need all of these skills and more in this very complicated world in which we live. I would be remiss if not to remind that we do have the National Security Summit, the Nuclear Security Summit this week. It is most focused on ensuring that fissile material does not fall into the hands of terrorists. In 2008, I was on the Congressional Commission on the Prevention of Weapons of Mass Destruction, Proliferation, and Terrorism. We identified a whole series of challenges, including securing nuclear materials. Some progress has been made, but we still have a long way to go. This is a staggeringly important time because, as Bob Gates said, as Secretary Gates said, and as I and Secretary Kerry, the President has said, what keeps most of us up the most at night is such material falling into the hands of a terrorist. The risk may be small in the scheme of all the things that can go wrong in the world, but the havoc that it would create in the world would be catastrophic and unparalleled. And so we have to do everything we possibly can to make sure that never, ever happens. I'm happy, as I said, to Bob and to John to take some questions, but mostly at the end here, I want to thank the organizations that are here that host you each year and the funders that make that possible. Each and every one of these organizations is a key member of the community for peace and a critical teacher and mentor. We would not have achieved the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action without all of you even those who disagreed with us, because disagreement forces you to make sure you've got it right, that the deal t details are correct, that you have the arguments that are going to prevail, that the agreement is durable over time. So criticism is an important part of the process, even if at times it's very painful to take. <laughs> so thank you. And do remember that even if you people get the headlines, the story, every story, has many, many, many more players. Thank you all for what you do, and I'm happy to take some questions. But not for too long, because I know you want to talk about each of the fellows and then get back to the bar and the appetizers. Bob, why don't you call on people? Tell me who you are. Uh, my name is Brad Harris. I work for Senator Feinstein. Um, I know recently uh, APAC has been pushing for a reauthorization of the uh, Iran Sanctions Act, um, especially in light of their um, ballistic missile activity. Um, I wonder if you consider that a violation of the, um, of the agreement and your opinion on that. Well, the Iranians certainly think it is. Um, you know, I think this has to be a process of consultation with the administration, and I know that's ongoing. So I want to be uh, a little circumspect about what I say. I think there are ways to work through this uh, that will satisfy everyone. Uh, but it is a difficult issue, and it was a very present issue during the negotiation. Um, 
Um, thanks. I, I got to do many extraordinary things in uh, government and, um, you know, given my background as Kathleen went through it and as I talked about it a little bit, it's really an unexpected life. That's the other thing I would say to all of the young people out here. I've never had a five-year plan. Um, I've honed a set of skills and then uh, tried to make use of every great opportunity that's come my way. Um, and one of the things I was, I was in the way that uh, Secretary Kerry and I really got to know each other very well was I was, as he called me, uh, his wingman on the uh, CW agreement, on the chemical weapons agreement um, with Russia uh, to get chemical weapons out of Syria, which was an extraordinary accomplishment in my view that's been way underplayed because I can't tell you for how long we sat in the situation room and thought, well, if we could even solve the Syria problem, how the hell were we going to get the nuclear weapons out of, uh, not the nuclear weapons, the chemical weapons out of Syria? Um, and then got to be part of uh, Lakhdar Brahimi's effort uh, to um, try to come to a political settlement uh, in Syria. I think that it was not possible to have Iran at the table until the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was done. Uh, and I think that Iran understood that that has increased the anxiety of risk of the countries in the region. Um, we were able to, in sort of concentric circles, get them engaged at least once with Saudi Arabia and certainly in proximity talks, which is critical. There will not be peace in Syria, I think, until Everyone is talking and at the table whether we like what they do or don't like what they do, and I don't like a lot of what Iran does in the world. So I think that um, there's possibility. I think Secretary Kerry's visit with Putin last week uh, was a worthwhile one, and I think that what Stefan de Mistura is doing uh, to try to use the proximity talks, uh, working with the bilateral discussions between Russia and the United States, is quite critical to seeing if we cannot move forward. There are lots of pitfalls to go, but no one believed the ceasefire would hold for more than five minutes, and it has held. Uh, not perfectly, but it has held, which means fewer people die. And it's not perfect, and it's not great, and we shouldn't have millions of refugees and internally displaced people and starvation used as a weapon of war, but at least for the moment, some people have a little bit of their life back. Hopefully we'll get to peace. Yeah. Hi, James Walter, former fellow from back in the dark ages. <laughs> you can't say that to me, dear. <laughs> so based on your interactions with the Iranians, do you think that this agreement will be an instrument for change, and what kind of change do you see? And how has the media either helped or hindered that process both here and there? You know, most people think of Iran, and there are some Iranian Americans here, so they, they know well. Uh, think of Iran as not having politics, as being led by a supreme leader and everybody just sort of marches in abeyance. That's not how it happens. It is a country with real politics, and I only half heartedly tease there are hardliners and hard hardliners. <laughs> Uh, you know, we talk about Rouhani as being a moderate. He's quite a conservative cleric, but he is less of a hardliner than Soleimani is the head of the IRGC, so the Inter uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. So, uh, and half of Iran's population is under the age of 30, and part of the reason that I believe that uh, the Supreme Leader allowed Rouhani to allow uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, who's a, a very uh, tenacious negotiator, uh, to uh, really engage in these negotiations, because remember, we had years of negotiations under Ahmadinejad. We just traipsed around the world accomplishing nothing. Um, and um, uh, so he allowed him, I think in large part, not to get the sanctions lifted so that people would see they might have a better life, because I think there was real fear that that younger population who was on the internet in spite of censorship and seeing what the rest of the world had why weren't they having it too? And if they didn't get some relief, if the economy did not improve, then the regime might face 
uh, an effort to overthrow the regime, and they didn't want that to happen more than anything in the world. Um, whether there will be fundamental change and whether that will happen anytime soon, I truly don't know. Uh, there are very strong tools of oppression uh, yet in Iran, uh, and uh, whether all of the countries who are now engaged in commerce with Iran will fundamentally change uh, Iran's future, uh, whether the opening up to the world will change Iran's future. I hope so, but I'm not counting on it. Uh, I think there are many things that Iran does that are terrible. There is still state sponsorship of terrorism. There is Hezbollah. Uh, there is destabilization of the Middle East. There is human rights abuses that are horrible. Uh, I, I don't urge Americans to go travel to Iran as much as I'd like to go myself. It's just too um, uncertain whether you'll end up in Evan prison. Uh, so uh, their missile technology, which threatens the region, even if it doesn't have a nuclear warhead on the end of the missile, uh, all of these things are of enormous concern and have to be resolved, and that's going to take some time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>